So heading over to you. Thank you Thank very you. much for being here. Thanks. So let's get started. Hello, everyone. So this is designers, developers, and dogs. It's our talk. It's our journey about finding the magic balance between product and tech. Um, I'm Sahil. I'm a developer and consultant at ThoughtWorks. And I'm Charlotte. I'm a UX designer at Chanel. And so um, our product basically was taking part at Chanel, uh, happening in Chanel. And Chanel uh, is a car sharing service provider. So um, we have roughly 12,000 vehicles out there on the street and we operate in 16 cities across eight countries in Europe. We have roughly 3 million customers and it's uh, quite easy to use our service. So you just need to download an app. You need to register and have a valid driver license, but then you can basically start driving with any available car that you want to use. And so enter MOPS. This was the product that Charlotte and I worked on starting at the end of last year. It stands for Mobility Operations Suite and is coincidentally also the German word for a pug, which gave us a really cool logo uh, in addition to that. And basically what this product is, is it's a tool for the customer support agents. So it has a way of understanding all the users of ShareNow, of understanding rentals, vehicles, and so on. And the features were things like being able to search, getting an overview of users, seeing, for example, when a customer calls, do they have any payment issues, any issues with driving licenses and stuff like that. And it was basically a replacement for an old tool that already existed. The old one was about, I think, 10 years old with a lot of legacy uh, technical issues. Uh, it was not really built with a lot of UX support. So you had, for example, some screens where just the data from SQL queries was in the UI. Uh, and the biggest or one of the biggest problems with this tool was with all the different teams and different domains in ShareNow, you had like seven interdependent teams very tightly coupled with each other trying to develop on this and trying to release with it. And when we got into this project, it was almost at a point where no new changes could be made because it was just too difficult to make new changes. So for the new tool, we set ourselves some goals that we wanted to achieve um, that goes beyond just pure replacements. So one thing we wanted to achieve was to reduce the call time because obviously for us as a company, the agent's time is money. So <clears throat> this is something where we saw improve opportunities to save costs, but also um, that would increase the customer experience if we managed to resolve their issues just quicker. And the second thing we wanted to do was just simplify the entire development of this very central tool. We wanted to decouple all those teams and be able to release stuff independently that was related to their domains rather than, rather than being coupled to this very slow release cycle with a lot of alignment needed. So here we came up with some uh, micro front ends approach for the foundation of the tool and we leveraged the existing component library, the existing design system uh, to make this much easier to develop and have a consistent UX across the tool. And another goal was to not just replicate exactly the same functionality as the old tool would include, but um, try to really uh, enable the agents to support even more problems of the customers to really give them all the data that is available within our different systems and give them all the actions they could potentially take on the car but also on the customer status to really make sure they are enabled to provide the best support that is possible and then finally with the technical improvements and the product improvements we wanted to shorten the lead time so we had noticed that there were already quite a few things that used to keep coming up, you know, small process changes, some new features that are needed every time something changes in the core product. And mostly this tool in the past wasn't able to react quickly enough to them. So with the new technical improvements and with the new way we were envisioning this product, we wanted to be more flexible about how quickly we could make those changes happen and provide a better customer support experience in the end. So, and we believe we were actually quite successful with our approach because we managed to launch basically in time. So after only four and a half months, we had enough functionality that we feel confident, felt confident that this is already meaningful enough to be used by our agents in their daily work. So this was rolled out to a small chunk of our user group. So 20 people after only four and a half months and the whole functionality was oh, that uh, functionality was then rolled out to the whole group after six months. So for us, that felt pretty quick. Um, also on the adoption, we saw good numbers, like five of those dependent teams 
already integrated within that new approach and I mean completely proactively so we didn't push anybody so they just um, moved uh, voluntary because the new micro front end approach was really handy for them um, and also we see um, already quite good um, numbers on the traffic so we have like 50 percent of our user journeys that already happen within the new tool so that really shows we were able to move over like the most meaningful chunks of functionality and to yeah move already a big chunk to us and then also on the feedback side we get quite some positive feed quality feedback so for example the stakeholders that we work together with are really happy to collaborate with us as a team so um they like our approach how we would involve them and how they could contribute with their ideas but also with their targets so one stakeholder wrote us like yeah you were one of the best teams that i worked with and kept me motivated so for us it was the same it was really cool to work with them but yeah that worked quite well and also the teams that are integrating with us like these other development teams that are now joining our micro front end approach um, they are super happy they find it easy to use um, clear and a good ar architecture but also in the combination with the micro front uh, with the component library this uh, is really handy for them to and, and fast to develop stuff and also our users give us really positive feedback like we have quarterly round tables where we just discuss um, fundamentals with our call centers and after the last round table actually four different people came to me and told me like Chana, did you already hear like the customer uh, the agents are so happy with the new mobs tool and um, they talked so long about it and yeah they seem really to like using it in their everyday work so for us that was really heartwarming to get that positive feedback and to see yeah that actually all users are happy with what we provided to them and not only our users and the goals that were successful but it was just a lot of fun for all of us to work on this project together and none of us had worked together before before we started and within six months i think we were a really close team we'd done before of course things changed we had done a lot of team events we had you know had gotten a really good collaboration and trust level going on and just on even on a day-to-day -day basis it was a lot of fun coming into work and it didn't it never felt like a chore and we just got along really well so it was a lot of fun working on this and that's kind of where the idea of this talk came out like I rolled off the project at the end of May, but we still kept in touch. And we were talking about like, you know, that we have both been in different projects and different teams and worked on a lot of products before, but there was something different, something special about this one. The whole experience was really positive. It worked out really well. We never really felt like we were struggling in ways that we did in the past. And we wanted to understand, was it just coincidence? Was it something special we did? Was it the environment? And that's where the idea of this talk came about, to try to figure out what those things were. And that's what we present to you. Exactly. So we reflected a bit, and then we came up with those 10 unique things that made our product so awesome. And you won't believe what happened next. So the first thing we did was we were doing product discovery, and we did it together. So we really went out of the building um, but not just the product team, but this time we also took the developers with us. And in our case, that meant we went out of the building and flew to Essence, because in Essence, our call center is located. That was a big sacrifice to go there. No, so but, uh, we had a great time and it was very productive because we had the chance to um, visit our call center and really sit there next to our agents, listen to calls where they were on the phone with our customers. And that was so good to really understand what are their working conditions? When is it getting stressful for them? When are the customers becoming really emotional? So how does the old tool work for them? Where do we see opportunities? Um, so we could also just have interviews with them while we are sitting there, but also we had round tables with novice users and expert users so that we could see like the differences and identify training requirements. Um, but also we talked to management to understand their constraints, challenges and goals. So that was so helpful that everybody in the team could just smell the air and get a very tangible understanding of our user and what they, uh, what they need to achieve with our tool we're building and providing to them. And basically what this really enabled us to do 
is to reframe the problem around the customer support process. So we saw what happens when a customer calls in, the agent answers the phone, what kinds of things they do in the existing tools, where do they get stuck? And using that data, using all, those, uh, all, the, all of that information, we tried to come up with, okay, so now as we transition from the old tool to the new tool, what are the most important user journeys? Where are the places where we can simplify stuff? Where are the places where we can improve things so that it's even easier and even faster to answer problems that the users have? And because of this close way of being able to see how the day-to-day -day work of the people using the tool happens, we were able to really rethink those user journeys and reframe them compared to the old one. And that also let us optimize certain things with the, with the new one and do them in a simpler and faster way. And also all this research had to somehow be documented and shared within the team. Um, so it was not just the research on the call center, but we also did more research in Berlin where the second level support sits and also just yeah, researched some technical systems and um, internal processes people would need to follow along. And all of this uh, knowledge was tried to be synthesized visually. So we built a lot of maps, customer journeys, diagrams, so for example, here on the left, you would see um, the process that we use to collect the money um, for specific invoices and how we then determine if an invoice is paid or not. And on the right side, you see that exact um, model as it was hanging in our office space. And I think what it shows quite nicely is that this model was really um, just the starting point. So somebody would maybe create this uh, in the first place, but then that's actually where the real work was to start and the collaboration and where we would as a pair or as a team or with external stakeholders or technical teams really go through and try to refine those models and uh, deepen our understanding, annotate with questions, put in new um, connections and strike out things that were we got wrong in the first place. So that really shows how that wasn't just a one-time thing and then you're done and move on, but we really try to deepen and refine our learnings as we went. And another thing we did in the discovery phase was an alignment workshop. So it was a pretty long workshop. It was two and a half days. Um, it was the team gathering, but also together with management. And the goal of the workshop was to decide on the scope of that project. So as the tool was so big, we had a lot of opportunities where we could actually start and um, we brought in all the information that we had um, gathered through the discovery work but also I mean some people were just very experienced and have been seeing and watching the pain points um, from the old tool for quite some years but also we had some research ongoing earlier like one or two years ago and all that knowledge was in the room and brought to the table and we really based on that, um, evaluated different opportunities, would draft high level solutions, and then um, de-risk also like where, what solution would cover which risk. And then as a, this group of people, we would collaboratively come up with a decision uh, on where to start. And that was so helpful because first of all, it was a very open conversation. There were no hierarchy borders. Everybody was really openly sharing their thoughts, knowledge and my, and ideas. And um, also it helped all internally, I think every team member to understand why we would not do this and why we would not start somewhere else. But also it was really great to see how management was involved and committed and how they spent like this long amount of time with us to find the good solution and the good scope where would be more uh, the most, where we would have the most effect and to also see them really being involved in those kind of collaborative exercises and um, yeah, handling on an eye level these discussions. And I think that really helped the whole team and set the stage for everything that was coming afterwards because the management was really leading by example in that case. So we figured out the product, we figured out what we were gonna build. The next thing was to set up our team. And here we felt we, did something really well. So in the teams that we had been in the past and many of the teams around us in share now, the setup was something like this, where you have a bunch of developers, a product owner, maybe if you're lucky, you have a UX person shared usually uh, most of the time. 
And the downside of this approach was while there was a lot of high focus on solving the technical problems, so you've got really good technical solutions, there was just not enough you know, capacity to solve or to, to understand the user problems rather, to, to do the research, to do the validation, to regularly talk to the users. There just wasn't enough effort spent or enough capacity to, to do those things. In our team, we kind of got lucky in the way we set it up, but we found that was really good that we did it that way. We had six developers, a mixture of front end, back end, and full stack developers. But then we had two UX uh, people on it. We had one product owner and we had a business analyst. And with this approach, we felt what was really good was we had enough resources to do the development work, but also to do the research work, the user research to, to do those experiments, to see, okay, what are the ways in which we can solve problems for the user in a better way. And this was kind of, in a way, like the idea of taking full stack, but to the product team, because now you have people, you have enough people to do, you know, the, the visual designs, to do the user testing sessions, to have regular catch ups with the other stakeholders, to, to kind of manage the whole user side of things. And it wasn't really, I would say it wasn't limited to just the so-called product people on the team because we were sitting so close together and we were talking very regularly. We, and because we had done all this shared user discovery together, it was really helpful for everyone to understand all sides of it. So the product side, the technical side, and the product people could then understand certain technical limitations. And you know, then we could make suggestions on, okay, maybe if you just change this part of the user journey, you still get the same value, but much faster and much easier and stuff like that. So it really helped us eliminate waste by sitting next to each other, but also by having enough people to do all the things needed for that product. And also, uh, as we were forming as a new team, one of the first things we did was to discuss our ways of working. So we uh, finalized or we um, agreed on which kind of meetings we want to have, in which cadences, what practices we want to use, like Scrum or Kanban or estimates, no estimates, but also uh, decide on our travel schedules because not everybody was located in Berlin where the core of the team was sitting. So we agreed on how much time this team would really want to spend together on site and how much time people could just uh, decide individually where that would be. Uh, and also we did an exercise or we uh, put some effort into clarifying our roles and responsibilities and that was extremely helpful. Also to do that really right at the beginning before anything already <clears throat> is being tried out or maybe um, not everybody covers the right um, expectations. So in that exercise, we just gathered together the group and everybody would bring the expectations he would have towards his own role, but also toward all the other roles in the team. And that was so cool because it was really open. Like you could just bring up everything you would be interested in. Like, of course, you have probably some core skills that are associated with your role, but then you might have some secondary skills that are just um, very individual from person to person. And that would really show quickly where the main focuses would lie, but also where there would be options for collaborations because maybe uh, there is an overlap between the disciplines and two people might wanna work on those topics together. So it helped us really to clarify, okay, where is really my responsibility to drive topics forwards, but also where should I maybe pair up with somebody because we would yeah, just share this topic together. And of course, I mean, this is something that is not set in stone because it's very individual. So each time your team changes, you should probably redo that exercise. We also did it again when we had a bigger team change. And yeah, I think it really helped us to open up and look at, okay, what is possible? Which setup could we do in that group of people? And I think that's always very different. And especially if people are just open to focus more on their skills rather than on their own. So the fifth thing we did, so we had done the initial product discovery, we had come up with the product, but we wanted to have more continuous feedback loops with the users. We wanted to understand them as we were building and kind of revalidate the approaches we were, we were taking even with the initial setup. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of data from the old tool we were replacing. It didn't really have any analytics. Um, but what we set up instead was just direct communication. So we, again, went down to interview the users. We did roundtables, like Charlotte mentioned. We also sent out surveys to understand certain patterns, certain behaviors. And we also repeated the field visits that 
we, we found that the first one was really valuable. So we thought we would do it again. And again, we got some new insights from that. We were able to see, okay, we've made some ideas, some experiments. Is that actually going to work for the initial rollout or is it something for the future? And it helped us revalidate those ideas. And then as we started to roll out to, to the users, we set up some feedback channels uh, on Slack. We had certain channels where people could reach us and ask questions. We had places where they could, you know, inform us if certain things were not working for them or, you know, just kind of have some understanding of the people who are also developing this product on a continuous way. Um, and also we tried to build in feedback cycles as we were rolling out our software. So not to just do a big bang rollout and then everybody sits there with the functionality, but to really start small and just roll out to 20 people and then get a close um, communication with them. And really, uh, for example, we did something we called first look sessions. So when they just get the new, uh, the access to the new tool, we would on the same day or the next day uh, have a session with the agents where we'd go through them, through through it with them and just get their first impressions to understand, okay, which of the concepts are easy to grasp, what is intuitively working, but also where do we maybe need to rework or where is functionality still missing until we can roll it out. And I mean, that process really was ongoing. So they were in constant communication when they did not understand things or still had trouble. Mm. And then we also did finally implement Google Analytics. And I mean, that sounds like a very basic thing. And obviously also we uh, just did a very basic implementation, but I mean, that was just a dramatic change for us <laughs> in uh, the quality of data we could have to take our decisions. So that was just extremely helpful to be able to now really see like, how is the traffic shifting? So we had the chance to not only implement it in the old tool and the new tool, but also in the old. So we could really see how the traffic was moving from the old tool to the new tool. We could see where the biggest functionalities would live. Um, and so where we should focus our effort on and put priority on to really move the most meaningful things out of the old tool. So with this product and with this tool that we were rebuilding, we kind of took on a bit of risk, right? So we had this old product that was a legacy product. It had its own issues, but it had been in production and was in active use by quite a few users. And we wanted to replace the whole thing. And we wanted to make some technical improvements and product improvements. So what we did was we actively tried to come up with the various product and technical risks that we were dealing with, and then try to find ways to de-risk them and try to de-risk them sooner rather than later. So one of the things we did was come up with a transition strategy to keep the, the construction sites low. So try to see, okay, what are the first few user journeys that we can port over to the new tool that make a lot of sense? Or what are the things what, that we can do to prevent, for example, users going back and forth between the two tools, because that would be quite a bad experience for them. And then from a technical point of view, um, we were trying, as I said, this micro front end approach, um, putting in the component library, also certain backend things that we wanted to do around the data of the system. And what we did here was we took the initial user journeys that we had come up with and sliced them really thin. So they were kind of very simple user journeys. But then when we implemented them, it was kind of in a way like a vertical slice. So there was real data, real integration with all the services that already existed. And what this gave us was you know, from a user value point of view at the end, not much because I think the first one was something like a search bar with a button. But then this was integrating with the real data, the real customer systems, the real authentication system. And when it was in production, I think in the first few weeks itself, this was the thing that, you know, didn't need to be replaced. It was production code, it was tested, it had the pipelines, it had the ability to be released continuously. And Initially, yes, the user value was small, but it validated a lot of the risks that we wanted to take and the approach that we wanted to take. And we had this uh, question, like, because of this, we had the question of, okay, are we building a prototype or are we building production code? But ultimately we knew what we're replacing is a production system and only another production system can replace it. A prototype would most likely be thrown away and maybe not even reworked on in the future. So this de-risking approach from a product and technical point of view that was quite a good thing that we did it in the beginning rather than at the end when it's time to release it. So, and um, 
as we were such a big product team, like with four people working on different um, product items, we would <laughs> we keep an eye on the time, Alexander. <laughs> we um, felt the need to bring a little bit more structure into this process and who would work on what and bring more transparency in because we'd lost a bit track, like what is the next item with priority. Um, and I think it was not as elaborated as a dual, tr dual track that Adriana was presenting earlier, but at least we tried to bring in a process and it was quite pragmatic and hands-on. But so what we did is we created like experiment cards for every idea we had where we saw an opportunity that was just a quick visualization of the idea, a little area for value estimation and some learnings. And then we had a Kanban board, which was actually also a physical board, um, where we would have five columns like to be validated in validation, to do analysis and design and backlog. So ideas would move into validation, there we would just uh, talk to stakeholders, get their opinion, talk to end users, look into data, run little experiments, and after that we would decide if we drop it or if we proceed with it. So then it would move into the to-do column. Some items also did not need validation because it was just clear we need it. Um, then the to-do column would be reprioritized and then it would move into analysis and design. Here we would just gather all the details that would be required to be confident that this thing can be you now developed um, as production code by developers or pairs uh, of developers and designers. And then if we were at that point, it would move into the backlog and then into the production backlog. So that was another Jira board. And that was super helpful to walk through the stakeholders, as also Adriana already mentioned that for us, uh, yeah, we just had a full backlog visualized on our wall with visual ideas. So we could just quickly talk people through whether it's stakeholders or external technical teams uh, or management. And, but also inside the team that was helpful to make this really more transparent and to communicate also with the devs that are naturally a bit less involved and to really be encouraged to involve them earlier uh, on the left side of the process. And another thing we did, we took this idea, so we had some familiarity with pair programming, but we took it and scaled it up to basically pairing with all the roles. So of course you had developers pairing with developers, but you also had designers pairing with designers, you had developers pairing with the BA, you had the POs and designers pairing, and just this mix of everyone kind of pairing on different kinds of things at different stages for, for different tasks. But it helped us to kind of, you know, different roles and different people to focus on a task and see from the same thing from different perspectives. And then we could kind of gain a better understanding and build better solutions and also can kind of validate sometimes like maybe you don't need a certain thing and then you just talk to somebody because they're sitting right next to you and do it much faster and that way we also when it came to onboard more people we could share the knowledge better we could validate our thinking better and you know in some way we're still pairing so i think it worked out pretty well and another thing that felt quite special in that team uh, was something that we call like no mental borders so we felt like um, this team was really open to also pick up work out of the comfort zone and probably it was also a bit driven because some people or quite a lot of people in the team had been in a different role before so I think there was a general openness to also work on something new or different than you would have exactly in your role description um, even though there was also some fear at the beginning some people were not so comfortable like Oh, should I really not start to work on that front end story and I'm maybe not so fast as somebody who did that already before maybe it take twice as long or um, maybe the quality isn't that good but I think quite quickly this confidence raised that actually it's more important to have somebody working on that and to keep the flow up and to avoid having bottlenecks because we don't have that skill set uh, in the amount that you just need uh, on the team but to and then maybe it's also fine if the quality isn't as good because the keeping up the flow is maybe just way more important in that moment so i really felt there was little of this ah oh, that's not my job thinking but the people were really committed to just get the stuff done and whatever it was if you felt somehow capable to achieve that or to get it done you would pick it up so that was really helpful to give us a feeling yeah okay we can deliver whatever it is we can achieve that as a team. 
And what enabled us to do that was we could just ask for help and talk to each other. And that kind of brings us to the last point. Our team, I would say, made a lot of noise, maybe to the detriment of the other teams around us. Uh, but this was really good. We were talking to each other quite a lot. We had managed to build a very safe, trusting environment where you never felt that, you know, if you're going to raise a question or have an idea, it's too dumb or not, not going to be taken seriously. Everybody felt comfortable enough to raise things. And this was really good. We were able to talk to each other quite a lot, understand each other quite a lot. And we never had this kind of ego issues where somebody felt, oh, you know, they're the only people who know the most about a certain thing. And it doesn't matter what other people's opinions on that are. And that felt really good to be a part of something like that. Yeah. And at the same time, it was also not only about work. I mean, it was also about uh, we were a new team and few people only knew each other before. and yeah just being a bit curious like who am i working with and who is that person and i don't know where does he come from what is their interest what are they passionate about like just to get to know each other a bit and i mean uh for example in our case like three of our six developers came from cuba so we definitely had to take a few cuba libras and to learn to dance salsa because ivan is actually not just a developer but also a salsa teacher <laughs> secretly and yeah so um we did a few activities where we would just get to know each other better and that was really also helpful then for the working situations because there was just so much trust and personal relationship in place that even if you had a conflict or heated debates you could be sure that it would actually end with a smile and it would be fine exactly so those were the 10 unique things that made our product very awesome. And the unbelievable thing that happened next was that we realized after coming up with these things that maybe they're not that unique after all. Exactly. So we even were like thinking, should we really do a talk about that? I mean, is any of that revolutionary new really interesting to anybody? Like you could read any of this book and a lot of that would be written in there. And I assume that there are probably even way more books out there that talk about these exact same collaborative methodologies and how to set up and how to align your strategy and so on. But still we had the feeling there's something missing or if we look in, in the industry and look at how teams actually work, it doesn't feel like this is the standard out there. And so that's where we kind of leave it off with a question for everyone here, like how can we go back and make these practices more common? In our experience, it's, it's a variety of different things. In this MOPS team, it worked really well for the various things we did, and we feel those really contributed to that. But what can we do to make those things happen in our other teams, in our other products, and in other organizations? And it, it could be a lot of different things. It could be about the culture, in the teams, in the organizations, and where that starts from, whether it starts from hiring, whether it starts from the mix of different teams, different ideas, and different people. It could also be from a product point of view. Um, to really build a good product, we need to continuously keep understanding the customers, and this takes a lot of time. So which time is that going to come from? Whose time is that going to come from? And who can invest in it and help you invest in those things? And similarly, when you move from this idea of project-based thinking to product-based thinking, the team structure changes, maybe the organization structure also changes. And then what kind of skills and competencies do we need to invest in to, to kind of promote them and make it easier to develop this way of thinking? But also like if we wanna shift from outputs more to outcomes as an organization, what do we need to have the teams really enabled to set up meaningful action, to take meaningful actions and what kind of strategy framework would they need to work with them to be really um, autonomous and be and able to create something meaningful that has an impact on the strategy and in the end on the customer's behavior. And also the question around how to deliver or how to keep up flow and by that deliver value versus um, utilization is something where we feel currently there's quite often a big, big focus on this velocity, like keeping the velocity of the developers up and really getting a lot of tickets done and having the utilization around, I don't know, ideally 100% of the developers 
um, that would be that's quite often the focus and maybe that's also something we would need to reflect on as organizations like is that really the thing we want to focus on or should we maybe yeah have a mindset shift around here so with that we end our talk with a lovely picture of our favorite pug moki and a quote from teresa torres uh, which says that if i had to bet on which teams were most likely to build great products i'd bet on the collaborative team every time and i would do exactly the same thing all right thank you and we'll take questions now thank you very much that was really great and i really would love to be part of such a great team of your team and i think we should be all more part of such teams and that would be really really great so there are a couple of questions coming in right now and i think the first one which is on top of my mind would be like how would you start like with such collaboration like where where where's the beginning point of that one which you see as a foundation so i think it's a few different things for us the collaboration really helped with the setup of the team because we had a wide variety of roles and competencies and skills in the team and so because of sitting closely and having you know kind of not a one-sided team where it was really development focused or really product focused we kind of had a good balance there and we were able to then have more conversations around those topics those topics became more common um, for developers to understand the products or the product people to understand developers and i think in the end what is collaboration it's really about trusting in the people around you and thinking from their point of view right and that comes from the conversations that comes from spending time together from understanding that the other person is also thinking from maybe a different but equally valid point of view and appreciating that but what i really believe makes a big difference is the start so really invest in that start mm -hmm. like in those kickoffs in those uh, alignment workshop for example to to really have the right mindset in that room already and also for example that roles and expectation exercise mm. that we really did that quite at the beginning so i've also seen that happening but then being postponed and postponed for four weeks or maybe happening only after six weeks and that's just too late really try to start at the beginning so that everybody gets in that mode right from the beginning so really invest for your team in your team when you when you start off in a team yeah. and also what i took away is like just listening to each other and like the thoughts you have in there i think you haven't mentioned it but you put it out now and i think it's not natural that we really take the time and listen to each other where we are connected to that maybe a little bit somebody asked like what's your opinion on salando's like the flexible teams like how how does it align or contradict with with this team bonding uh example or things what you described what happened in that yeah, actually we were discussing that before it and i mean what i would think i believe if you have a kind of um, a bigger bit bigger than the atoms like maybe two people or two three four people nah, like i mean that you don't shift always everything individually but have like one pair that is really mm. working great together and that is already in such a collaborative mood or mode then you can easily just onboard also more people to that core group. So I think if you make sure that there are a few um, uh, pieces that work already in that mode and that you don't always destroy those, but keep them alive and bring them in each flexible team, I could imagine that this actually would work. And I think once you kind of develop a shared culture, it also doesn't take that long because we were in the same team for only six months and we were already working pretty well from the first you know month or first few weeks so i think even with this flexible teams model you don't need a lot to spend a really long period of time to understand all the people around you once you kind of have certain uh, a kind of certain base for everything i think this can scale out pretty well and then you know you get to know more people you get to work in different teams and i i see a lot of benefit of that Nice. It's it's nice how you emphasize like when you have a team already working together and like having that base and that culture and I think culture mm -hmm. comes to life when you have more people in it. yeah interacting with each other and yeah. leaving that DNA alive. It it takes two. It takes the pair and it takes somebody who can like it takes those two to build it across that one. And I think for for a single person, it's very hard to build that on top when yeah. the DNA is not there and to build that trust and the culture in there. 
and, and be that right role modeler and to lift that as a role model. I think that's a very, very nice point you're making there. There's another question coming in, not via the Q&A, but directly to all the panelists there from Alejandra. You ask like, I have the same problem of the team being more focused on tech. How did you do that? How did you approach that the client focus on the users? So how did you really shift that from being that tech focus towards more user focused? I think for me, it was the, a very key thing that even before the project officially started, so I'm a developer, right? I went down to meet the users and it sounds like such a simple thing. It sounds like maybe even a stupid thing, but I think it has a huge impact when you can sit with the people who are actually going to use the product and see how they use it. You don't even have to do anything else, but just sit with them, observe what they do. You kind of get a feel for this is the product that I'm building. You get this connection with this is not just a bunch of services and a, and a nice UI on top of something. This is something that solves a person's problem on a regular basis. And something like being technical, of course, that's important, right? You want to build solutions that last, that are, that are stable. But to shift from a product thinking, I think for me, it's, it was just about being with the users on a regular basis, understanding them. And I think it's something that everybody can do given enough exposure to it. And I believe, I mean, to me, the biggest impact here was that we had that balance team set up where it was not just a PO with a little bit of UX, but we had just four people. Mm. I mean, we were not all full-time, but still four people working on product topics and pushing that. And I, I, honestly, I still don't understand why we actually believe that we just need one PO in a delivery team. Like, I mean, you would also not have the idea that you need just one developer. So. Yeah, that to me is a mystery, and I really believe our product team should be bigger. Mm -hmm. Just have more balance. Yeah, yeah. The the balance. I think you, there are two great issues in there. It's one. It's the structural element in there, the systemic element. How can you balance the, the structures and the systems in a team? And I think when you have just like one perspective, I think that's that that doesn't work. And the other element, what you put in there, which is really nice, is this the human element of creating empathy. And that comes when you just connect with the people again, and you really are in their environment. You have the conversations, and I think that's just like enables this mindset mindset change, which is really important and key that everybody keeps the user in their mind, and that goes beyond seeing it on paper, or just hearing about that one. Maybe we have like time for one more question before we move to the next uh, presentation. Uh, the one in there, which is quite interesting, is there like, do you have any ideas how you would recreate that experience now in this remote setting when you're like, it's not based on experience, but maybe you can just think about like, how, how can you create that safe space, that collaboration, that learning, that engaging with the users when everybody just sits at home? Mm. Yeah, I mean, we, we still do usability tests. And I mean, the crazy thing is like our call center in essence is also shut down. So they are all also working from home. So it's definitely harder to get the full picture. Definitely. And I mean, probably you would just need to invest more to get, yeah, that density of information. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's still possible to talk to them and to watch them work, um, even though remote. So... Yeah, I mean, we also transitioned to a remote setup in the middle of the team. And I think we didn't really have a decrease in those activities that we were doing before. We still kept pairing. We still had conversations across roles. And I think the remote setup, of course, makes the social aspect of things much more difficult. Um, but having that culture is not gone, I think, with the remote setup. Yeah. But still, I mean, we're here today yeah. face to face. So that shows that we actually prefer even the real real world yeah that's nice you're there in person and even like one of your teammates just wrote in the chat as well that it was one of the best teams she participated in ever so and she really misses laughing with you so that really those bonds and that collaboration and that understanding like uh, yeah transcendence beyond the, the real space into the virtual as well very nice thank you for being here thank you for joining that thank conversation you for and sharing your experiences